Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it is a blessing to you. We're, we're in uh, a series called On Your Mark, and we've just been um, going through, I called it a survey, but what I realized is I do get a little bit more in depth than maybe a survey at times. Um, going through the book of Mark, starting the week after Christmas, going until Easter, we're going through the whole entire gospel of Mark. And Mark says at the beginning, uh, in Mark 1, verse 1, the beginning of the good news or the gospel about Jesus the Messiah or Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He lays out what we are getting into in this series that we're looking at Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we're doing it for 16 straight messages in a row. And um, today we happen to be in Mark chapter 4. And I don't have time for review. Um, we've just seen awesome things through the authority of Jesus Christ and his preaching and casting out demons. And uh, it's just been awesome, I think. Uh, so if you want some review, all of our messages are online. And so I encourage you to check those out so that you can go with us through the entire book of Mark and, and just looking at the, the life of Jesus and his earthly ministry um, in the book of Mark. So let me pray and then let's get going. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, guys, we've had the opportunity to worship you through song, uh, and that now we get into your word, and God, we just uh, now pray to you, Lord God, that you would do a work inside of all of us here. God, I pray that your, your word would um, go down deep, that we would hold on to it, cling to it, and that it would produce in us. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> so um, we're going to move fairly quick today because what we have going on in Mark chapter 4 is uh, length and depth. It's a fairly long chapter and there's some very deep things in it. And so some things will hang out in a little bit longer. Some things we'll read and just kind of have a couple statements on and then keep moving. But I want to kind of honor what we've done so far and going through every verse in the book of Mark as we go. So if, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 4. Um, if you didn't bring one today, uh, it'll all be on, on the screen as we go. If you're taking notes, though, right, sower, seed, and soils. Sower, seed, and soils. It's a very popular parable that starts off Mark chapter 4. If you've heard it before, I pray that you still listen today with open ears and an open heart. Um, if you've never heard it before, I believe it's going to be uh, new and beautiful and exciting for you today. So uh, Mark chapter 4 starts off, again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. Last week we talked about him going by the lake and being such a big crowd that he was getting crushed and pressed on. And the crowd that gathered around him was so large, would have been in the thousands. Uh, we're not sure exactly how many thousands, but it, I don't know if you remember, but it said people came from the north, the south, the east, the west, all the surrounding cities, regions, areas came to Jesus. And we know from stories like the feeding of the 5,000 that that was 5,000 men, not including women and children. That was probably much more like 10 to 15,000 people without a microphone. Think about that. Um, so he, he's kind of pushed in. The, the crowd is very large, and so... Uh, he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. If you remember last chapter when something like this happened, he came to the lake and they had him prepare a boat, but he didn't go out in the boat. This time he goes out into the boat <clears throat> on the lake. That's the Sea of Galilee. While all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. So you can kind of get this picture. Jesus goes out into a boat, but close enough that they could hear him. And the people are all along the edge, kind of tiered out so that they can, they can hear what he has to say. They've come because of his miracles, because of his wisdom, um, a lot of them would come because they've just heard of what God has been doing in Christ. They, they've heard that the demons get cast out and that people get miraculously healed. And, and Jesus, through his ministry in Galilee, has kind of uh, obliterated sickness. Like everybody that comes around him or where he goes, he just heals everybody. And, and so um, you can imagine that now what that would look like in the context of our day. It'd be like if Jesus is here, like all of a sudden Thurston County just doesn't have sickness. And people just start coming in from everywhere um, to, to see what's going on. So that's kind of the picture we get here. And Jesus goes off 
in a boat a little bit, makes a little bit of space. Um, and how many know that would have helped for projection over the water? It also would have uh, made it easier for the people maybe in the second, third, and fourth row of this mob to be able to hear him. Um, when everybody's on top of you without some sort of platform or pushback, that's hard to hear. <clears throat> He taught them many things by parables and in his teaching said. So we're going to look at this parable. But um, a parable is a story. It's a parable is, is from the same kind of root word as parallel. And so what it is, is it's a story that lays beside, like parallel lines. It's a, it's a story that lays beside a, a spiritual truth. So it's a, a, usually a practical story that you would understand kind of what this story is saying and now apply that to the other thing I'm saying here. It's a, it's a parallel. Got it? So this is the one we're going to look at today. The sower, the seed, and the soils. Well, one of the ones we'll look at today. Listen! Exclamation point. A farmer went out to sow his seed. I think this is just interesting. So all the people come, the majority of them to see a miraculous work happen. I want to see people healed. I want to see demons cast out. Maybe I'm sick and I want to get close to Jesus. And Jesus makes a little bit of space and then begins to talk. And it's not some sort of like turning to um, a really hard chunk of the Old Testament necessarily to start here. He just starts with a random, or not random, I guess it's very purpose, but it would seem random if you're just over in the crowd. Listen! A farmer goes out and scatters his seed. That just seems like your dad would teach you that on the farm. Like that doesn't seem like you go see the Messiah, the God in the flesh, and that's what he would start by saying. But he says, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Understand that in that day... um, Fishing and then like agriculture, farming was a big part of what, what happened in that area. And so <clears throat> they would have understood that they didn't have like fenced off areas of farming. What happened is you kind of had your land that went out to where the pathways were and you would seed all the way out to there. And so some of it would land on the pathways. And, and you would kind of understand that from the story we already saw about Jesus' um, disciples that are with him grabbing grain on their way through the grain fields, they're on a pathway going somewhere that comes right up against where the harvest is. You with me? So the farmer goes out and he scatters seed. He scatters it everywhere and some of it falls along the path. And the birds came and ate it up. You ever put seed out for something and see the birds come? Like you want to grow grass in your backyard and then all it does is make you angry because birds come steal seeds? You haven't done that? Okay, cool. <clears throat> Some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. So it's not only talking about having rocks in the dirt. Primarily it's talking about not much depth of soil. That, that you don't have to go very, very far down before you get really rocky soil that would prevent roots from being able to get down deep. Where it did not have much soil, it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. So there's only one place for that, that seed to grow, right? There's, first, it should be growing down to get strong and then come up, but there's only one place. It just comes up because the soil doesn't have the depth to be able to provide for that because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. It couldn't sustain. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. I mean, so far, that just sounds like, well, yeah, right? Like if seed sits on the ground, birds are going to get it. If seeds don't have any depth, they're going to spring up quick and not have roots, and so the weather, the, the weather can take them out pretty easy. Um, how many also know that if you've ever tried to plant something before, a garden or whatever, you have to weed it? Because if you don't, like weeds grow faster, then whatever you're trying to cultivate and grow, and and, and they will choke out the the strength of and the the production of the thing you're trying to grow. So this is all seems very practical coming from um, the Messiah. Still, other seed fell on good soil. Finally. It came up, grew, and produced a crop. Some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. So the story, although it's very practical in the way that it's laid out, it would make sense to the people of the day because of the culture that they lived in. Um, nowadays, if you went 
around and maybe said this story, it might take people thinking through it because not very many people actually go sow seeds and grow things. Would you agree? But, but back then, everybody does that kind of stuff. So um, he, he says a very clear paralleling story, a parable. Um, but this end part is miraculous. Just so you know that, the growth he's talking about when it says 30, 60, and 100 fold, is still a, it's a miraculous production. It's a, it's, it's a produces in a miraculous way above the regular percentages that a, a seed would produce. Here's the interesting thing. Jesus leaves that story just like that. We, if you've heard the parable before, we're going to get into it in a minute because Jesus explains it to his disciples, but to the crowd, that's the end of the parable. Do you think, like, think about that. If you understand the story, if you know where we're headed here, where, where the soils are and Jesus describes them, then you're kind of like, oh, I know what he's talking about, I know what he's talking about, I know what he's talking about. If you had never heard that before, and we just stopped here today, the message, you came for the message, and I just preached through like, hey, you throw a seed on the ground, some of it goes on the path, birds get it. Some of it goes along rocks, it doesn't really go deep, so weather gets it, it's gone. Some of it amongst thorns, thorns choke it out, and some of you plant on good soil and it grows miraculously. See you guys. You'd have been like, I could have gone to an agriculture class or like whatever, like, and got that. Like, that's not why I'm here. So it's just interesting to realize that, that Jesus speaking in those parables, we need to understand that sometimes that was confusing for people. And it explains that right here. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. He started the parable by saying, listen. And then he ends by saying, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Well, what is that saying? That some people don't have ears to hear. Okay. When he was alone, the 12, we, we met them in, uh, last week, and the others around him. We also met, kind of, without names, the others around him. When his mother and brothers come and say, like, hey, tell him that his mother and brothers are outside waiting for him, he looks at the ones around him, his disciples, the ones learning and listening to what he had to say. Um, they're here again. So the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, listen to this. The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. That's, that's grace. That's God just deciding to reveal himself. Um, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. So that, and here's what can be a, a confusing piece of scripture. I hope to make it make sense. They may be ever seeing, but never perceiving. And ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. That's a quote from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 is a very popular chapter, primarily because the beginning of Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is um, one of the major prophets in the Old Testament. At the beginning of Isaiah chapter 6, we find a line that maybe you've heard before. I Isaiah um, sees God and, and, and the, the glory of God and is kind of overwhelmed and realizes that he's dirty and, and unworthy and, and uh, an angel basically comes to him with a coal, this hot coal, and touches his lips to make him holy. And then God says, like, who will I send? And Isaiah says, send me. So that line, if you grew up in church, you've probably heard that line. Like Isaiah, Isaiah says, I'll go, God, send me. And we all, all respond with like, man, that sounds great. Like if God tells me to go, I want to be that kind of guy. Send me. I dare you to read the rest of Isaiah 6. Because it sounds really fun when you just keep it in that context. But when you read the actual context, it goes on to say, he said, this is God saying to Isaiah, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding. What kind of a calling is that? Okay, go and tell, you're the prophet. Go tell everybody, you're not going to understand what I'm telling you. And what you see, you're not going to really grasp. Be ever seen but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. That sounds like, wait, what, doesn't God want to reach people? <laughs> like, that kind of sounds like you're going you're gonna to declare the gospel or tell people about God, and, like, your plan in doing so is to harden people's hearts so that they won't be saved. Is that what that sounds like? You guys can respond. I know you're already thinking about the Hawks game. The, the pregame's not even on yet, I don't think. <laughs> Actually, it's been on for weeks. What am I talking about? I want to say this statement um, that I think will help us grasp what's said here. 
Charles Spurgeon, um, sometimes called the, the Prince of, of Preachers. He was a pastor in the 1800s in London. Many say that he spoke to upwards of like 10 million people throughout his life. Prolific, prolific author, speaker, just a booming voice they talk about. Um, he said this, The same sun which melts wax hardens clay. And the same gospel which melts some persons to repentance hardens others in their sins. That when Jesus is saying, like, I, I tell him this in parables, what happens is the same thing he's speaking does two very different things in people. That some people are hardened toward, we see it all through scripture. Jesus says the truth and the Pharisees are like angry and want to kill him. While other people are like, that was beautiful. I need more of that. I'll follow you anywhere. You're the only one that speaks truth. Like on your lips is wisdom and I need more. Like, and even if everybody leaves, I'm following after you. While others are saying like, because you just said the exact same thing, I'm going to kill you. And so in Jesus delivering these things in parables, to the ones that he reveals himself to and uh, the understanding of the parables, they're drawn to him. To the ones that are hard-hearted and, uh, and hard in their sins, they're more calloused from him. You've recognized that before. Have you ever been to a sermon before um, or, or, or heard something from God before and you were with somebody else and one of you got like this massive revelation from it and, and like were set free and the other person left like mad? Maybe you've invited somebody to church before and that happened. You're like, this is the best message it ever could have been. It spoke right to the person's life that I invited today. And, and afterwards you're like, well, what'd you think? And they're like, eh, I don't really know. It's, uh... What? Like, did you miss that? Like, Jesus died for you. Like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, like th that happens. And, and it's, it's all to God's glory. But that in that, um, Jesus references Isaiah and the fact that he would speak the truth and that it would have um, these two, it, it, it defines a line and it pushes some people to the cross and some people in their sin push away from the cross. And we'll look at that a little more um, as we get through Mark chapter 4, the rest of uh, the chapter today. So after he says that, um, he says, then Jesus said to them, so he decides to, to explain the parable that he just told to his disciples, the 12, plus the other disciples that are there, the other learners that are around him. And, and this is awesome. Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? He's like, listen, this is the easiest one there is to understand. <laughs> if you don't get this one, how are you going to understand the other ones? The farmer sows the word. So let's talk about for a second the, the sower, the seed, and the soils. The sower right here is the farmer. And Jesus, while he's declaring this, he is the farmer. Like Jesus at that time is declaring the word to people. He's the one scattering it everywhere. And you can see the effects of, of, of all of these soils we're going to see today throughout that. In, in kind of in a secondary way, now anybody who declares the word is the farmer. Anybody that sows the word. So all of us. The Great Commission calls us to go and preach the gospel to all of creation, to make disciples of all nations, so that all of us are called to be the farmers in this story. But right here, you've got to understand that Jesus is, is the main farmer. He's the one telling the story as the farmer, and that we would come down in, in that realm as farmer like him. Uh, so Jesus and anyone else sowing seed. The seed right here, it says, is the word of God. In Romans 10, 17, it says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. That, that it's the gospel. It's a going around, and I believe it's in Matthew, it talks about the, the seed is the word about the kingdom. And so it's, it's going around and sharing all over the place the gospel of Jesus Christ in hopes that some would here and it would be revealed to them and they would grab onto that but we share it everywhere we'll see it in a moment but all of us that have come to faith came from hearing the message of jesus christ so that's the sower and the seed the soils let's look at the soils the farmer sows the word some people are like seed along the path <clears throat> where the word is sown as soon as they hear it Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. You know, the path um, in that day and in all days, if, if you go over here, in fact, we're at the high school, so if you leave here and see the way students leave that aren't on the sidewalk, you know what I'm talking about. They build sidewalks, 
made of cement so it can handle people going back and forth. But who needs that when there's a shortcut and you can just go on the grass? And so you see these places where the grass is gone because of just foot traffic and the ground is compacted. It's very hard. And so right here, you're t- it, we're looking at the heart. When it's talking about the soil, in Matthew, it, just, it straight up says that the soil is the heart. And, and so it's, it's sown on a hard heart that the seed doesn't penetrate. It sits on the top of and that Satan comes to steal it. In John 10.10, 10, it says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So the, the word is powerful, but when it sits on top of a, a hard heart, um, Satan comes to steal that. Okay. We see the seed sown on the path. <clears throat> Others like seed sown on rocky places. Hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. <clears throat> um, that's oftentimes the problem with getting too amped up about the number of people you can get to an altar call and calling that save lives. Like, there's certain things that will get people to an altar call. I was at uh, an amazing event um, Locally here, uh, it was a youth event called Repossess. And the speaker was phenomenal. Uh, but at the end, he like didn't give you the option to not respond to the altar call. Basically, because it was like, hey, if you're going through this, stand up. If you're going through this, stand up. Well, eventually, everybody's going through stuff. If you're struggling with sin, stand up. <laughs> Everyone. Right? Like, okay, all of you come to the front so we can pray. Like, today, you're all giving your life to Jesus. And it was like, wait a second. <laughs> Like you, you don't get a count like, you know what, I bet a, a thousand. Like every single person that ever shows up to my events gets saved and gives their life to Jesus. Because there's points of emotion or um, points of knowing where people are at where you can get a response that is quick and brief and not real with no depth that doesn't produce anything. And, and so sometimes what happens is, um, and we've seen it here uh, at, at our church is that um, maybe you've come up in a place where people say like, yeah, I'm saved. And, and what they realize is after they're hearing the gospel over and over again is like, no, I kind of just like said a prayer out of emotion one night at a conference where everybody was crying with my, I was crying with my friends. And so I just like said something because that was kind of the response, but there was no depth that happened. There was no roots that stuck. In fact, all I've done is turn away and run. Uh, I hope you're hearing this. Um, so what we see here is on the rocky places where the word at once is received with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. Um, people need roots. The roots? Think about it. Um, <laughs> but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The rocky ground. Trouble and persecution come because of the word. So they've received it. They're excited about it. And they oftentimes want to tell um, lots of people about it. And that's not bad. That's a good thing. Um, what's bad is if there's not some sort of depth that happens in that, some sort of roots that go down deep. Why? Be- because the weather's coming. The, the trouble, the persecution, the pushback, the heat of the sun will come. And at that point, we want people prepared to be able to stand and weather the storm. Or even just the heat. In 1 Peter 1, um, we'll just read 6 and 7. I'd love to read 6 through 9, but i got a lot to get through today. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. What's that saying? It's not bad that the sun shines on you. It reveals if it really has any depth or not. The only way to kind of see the depth of the roots is to to expose to maybe some sunlight and some trouble and some persecution. That's where we know that, okay, this is real. And not that we hope that people burn out. That's the last thing we want. We hope that people get roots. 
so that they have strength. And realizing that, hey, this isn't like, okay, sometimes you'll fall and during persecution you'll mess up. It doesn't mean you're not saved. There's an assurance of faith if his spirit's inside of you reminding you that you're a son or daughter of the Most High God. But understanding that you're called to be able to stand against those things and it makes the genuineness and assurance of your faith real. That when you make it through those kind of things, all it, all it does is, is kind of help you feel good and give more glory to God about the fact that God, God kept me through this. It wasn't just some emotional thing. It has some legs now. It has some strength to it. It's been refined by fire, and it's still here. Okay. Maybe we've been these things before. Oftentimes what happens is we sit in the room and we, we understand ourselves in these stories of where our heart's been. You know what, God, I've been that guy. I know I've been that, especially as a youth. Oh my goodness, that's one of the hardest things when I was a youth pastor is that you see this all the time because kids are really excited about stuff. And so like you'll have a service, you'll have a camp or go to a conference and they get just jacked. They're like, yeah, Jesus everything. And then by like Tuesday, it's all flipped upside down because they went back out into the regular world. And the pushback against the new them was stronger than they could handle. And so every week you're like, no, you can do this. You know what I mean? Like, God's great. He's got you. His strength inside you is greater than that of the world. And you're just continuing to deliver that until you start to see the roots go down deeper so that next week maybe they stand a little more strong. Okay. So there's trouble that's going to come and it refines. And then in Matthew 5, 10 through 12, it talks about persecution. It says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It's good to get those kind of verses down deep inside of you so that when pushback does come, you have some sort of strength to turn on. This is like, those kind of verses help you get your root structure. Like, okay, get strong because persecution's coming and you're blessed when it does because it's coming because of who you stand with. It's Jesus. Okay. So we see the path. We see the rocky places that hear the word and at once receive it with joy. And like I said, maybe you're here today and you can define, you know what, I've, I am that. I, I receive it with joy and, and then I get burned up and have no strength that sustains. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Maybe that's you today. Or you could at least identify it in your past. Where you say, you know what? It, I really did feel like something started to change. And like something started to happen. And I, I felt like I started to grow. Um, but the, the worries of this world and the deceitfulness uh, of wealth or the deceitfulness of wealth um, or the desires of this world distracted me and choked out what was happening in me. That sometimes Satan will just come steal that before it ever um, gets any depth. Sometimes he'll just uh, push back against it with persecution and see if he can burn you out. And then thirdly, he'll just try to distract you and, and shift your priorities. And you can see that, right? That sometimes when we're here, we're in the presence of God, getting into the word of God with the people of God, and our priorities get aligned. And we're like, as we worship, God just fixes everything into alignment. And we feel good about it. I'm going to go get everything back. God, you're right. I don't have to worry about these things. You are my provider. God, I'm content with what you've given me. And God, I pray that I would just be grateful for what I have first before I worry about being covetous about my neighbor's stuff. And we get in that place, but then we go home, and like on the way home, we see the car pass us, and we're like, that's what I need. <laughs> you laugh because it's true. You laugh because it's true. In Matthew 6, it talks about um, worrying, that we should not worry, that God cares for the sparrow and the flowers in beautiful ways, and, and aren't we more precious to him than that? As far as deceitfulness of wealth, 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10 says this, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Hmm. 
Now clearly that's talking about in a selfish kind of rich way. Not a, man, I really want to be a good steward of the business skills God gave me so that I can be generous for his kingdom. But in a way that says, like, I need to get mine. And I'll do whatever I need to do. It's the get rich or die trying kind of idea. Like, I don't care who I have to cut off, who I, what I have to do. It, the most important thing for me is stacking money. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. That's been taken out of context a lot. Sometimes people will say, like, it's the root of evil. Um, Money's not the root of evil. There's many things. <laughs> um, it is a root. And, and, and like it says here, it is a root of all kinds of evil. Why? Because when that's your goal and that's your God, you'll do anything to worship that God. And you'll push things out of the way. You'll ruin relationships. You'll do sketchy things. And... and um, and it's all for that. It's to honor the God you serve, which is money at that point. Huh. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Let me help you just feel okay. Uh, if you make a lot of money, this isn't trying to make you feel bad. It's a priority issue. It's about um, clinging to God and his word and his ways or clinging to the ways of the world which are everybody look how flashy I am and that's where my status comes from is whoever has the most is the best. And so I feel like I have to compete with everybody and what is it, keeping up with the Joneses and, and do all of those types of things because I got to show you that I got it together and this is how I show you. It's so wrong that we put our identity in something that is fleeting that in a moment you could lose all of it, then how do you feel about your identity? It gets choked out by worry, deceitfulness of wealth. 1 John 2, 15 through 17, the desires of the world says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. This is what happens. The world is very loud and it speaks often. And so it, the culture pushes in on us and, and regularly makes us feel like to be outside of alignment with the world is wrong. And so we start feeling all kinds of ways about if we're keeping up with the world. And so um, the problem is all the world ever has to offer is temporary things that fade. And, and, but we'll sell out the, the eternal for the temporary so that we feel a certain way about the people around us, the culture around us, which will change, which will fade, which is broken and flawed. But you could probably look in our own lives, all of us, and see places where we were meant to honor God, but instead had a feeling of, I need to fill in the blank, to keep up with the world, because I deserve something, like to, for, to, to fulfill my flesh. Um, and in that, it choked out and, and made it so that there wasn't a, a producing of fruit in our lives on a biblical following God kind of level. I think one of the places that, that oftentimes can be the most clear, specifically because um, here Jesus talks about wealth, and finances and other places <clears throat> says you cannot serve both God and money. <clears throat> because what happens is um, when you have to make a choice, it's, uh, there's going to be a, a, a point where there's a choice to make and you have to choose which one you serve. And specifically that happens a lot as far as giving. We don't talk about giving a lot here. Um, we just kind of go like, hey, here's the envelope. You came ready to give today. Um, put that in the bucket on the way by or drop that in the box on the way through. And we do that for a purpose. There's a reason we don't every week give you a 10-minute message on um, why you should tithe. Primarily because it's a part of Christian living. It's not the thing about Christian living. But to say that it's not a part would be wrong. It is a part. 
Um, and, and so oftentimes Jesus, in fact, regularly Jesus uses money as an example when he's talking about a biblical thing because money is tied to our hearts. And so when we look here, listen, I can just be real. And, um, like giving to God's kingdom and the, the pushing forward of God's kingdom, sometimes it's really easy to look at people who um, buy themselves stuff and have it be a hard time giving to God's kingdom. Because you go like, imagine what I could do if I didn't give. And, and we can wrestle through that because the ways of this world come to like choke out us following after God in those types of ways. And so I think um, because Jesus straight up talks about money right there, the, the deceitfulness of wealth, the worries of this life, which are almost all financial normally in those types of ways, and desires for other things come in and choke the word and make it unfruitful. Um, often there, that's what we'll see. That right there what it is is trying to decide who do I serve? God or money. And then lastly it says, others like seeds sown on good soil. <clears throat> Say good soil. You know what, I heard something interesting when I was studying this week because I read lots of commentaries or, or read lots of other guys that teach on these um, chunks of scripture to, to kind of get a better grasp and I pray about it and ask God through his Holy Spirit to, to show me. I look in other places in scripture to say like, okay, how does this work in all of scripture? And uh, one of the things I, I never had thought of before a, until this week was I always thought there was only four soils represented here. The path, the rocky places, the thorns, and the good soil. But the good soil is actually broken up into three categories. Anyway, that was kind of refreshing for me. <laughs> because this is a story of evangelism. This is a parable about sowing the seed of the word of God everywhere that you go, not knowing where it will produce and where it will be choked out, but being um, a good steward of the seed that God's given us that we give it everywhere that we go. And it can seem intimidating when you go like, okay, I know this isn't a ratio. It's not a Bible ratio. It's not like, okay, if I share the Bible, if I share the word of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ with four people, one's going to get saved because the Bible said so. It's not like that, but it is kind of discouraging when you say like, oh wait, you just defined three soils that don't receive the word of God and have real production. And then there's the good soil, um, and it's kind of refreshing to go like, wait a minute, there's good soil that produces some 30, some 60, some 100. There's three different good soils right there, folks. Feel a little better about it, okay? If it was a ratio, it just went to 50% instead of 25, so woo! Um, not only that, but we see that the production that happens from this is miraculous. It says other, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word. They attain it. They accept the word. They understand the word. They retain it. So they, they receive it and they hold on to it. Other places, um, it says cling to or grasp. Um, and, and so check this out. They attain it, retain it, and produce a crop. They remain holding on until there's a production that happens. Something is produced in them, uh, through them, and they produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. That's a mirac miraculous crop. It's a miraculous harvest. It's miraculous. But, but how many know the, the power of that seed on good soil? It, we're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that the Holy Spirit comes in when that happens and does something phenomenal and that there should be results in our life. And we don't preach like results like, oh, the only way you know if you're saved, you do A, B, C, and D. No, your faith in Jesus Christ, the grace that is given by God to us and our faith in that is what saves us. But a saving seed that goes down deep and is clung to, clung, is that a word? Um, held on to, produces a crop in our lives. There should be some sort of output that happens because the seed is too powerful to not produce. And some of you have testimonies about, man, my family history is all um, a bunch of people far from God, but God in me um, did a work, and now my family line, you can see a production that God changed everything with the seed. Um, and, and, or maybe um, just through ministry, right? Like, I believe that God saving me, that plan in that was a, a, 
producing plan. It was a plan to save me so that I would repeat what, what he has to say and others would come to faith. And that it would produce a, a great return because it's the gospel. Hmm. John 15, 4 and 5 says this, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. To ever think that we can grow in any sort of godliness without God is, is deception and religion. It's us trying to put on a show and, and do these, these things like, no, look, I have fruit. And it's, it's not the way that it works. We, we oftentimes spend so much effort trying to show people fruit that isn't real that we just like hold on to to show like, no, look, I'm good. Instead of just using that energy to cling to God and fruit will produce itself. Hmm. Something I want to tell you about this is that it shows conditions of the heart. It shows hardness of the heart. It shows a uh, lack of depth in the heart. It shows um, uh, priority pulls and, and can, um, well, how would I say that? that just confusion in the heart um, about the world or, or the word. And, and it shows a, a pure heart that would receive the word in that kind of way. The sower's the same, the seed's the same, the soils are different. And, and the only one that can change the, the soil is God. And, and that can kind of seem daunting when you feel like, man, I've been throwing seed at this person that's just a path. And, and every time I sow it, it just gets gobbled up um, by Satan. Like nothing sticks. Or maybe like I, I throw it and it goes down a little bit and then they just burn out and it, you get frustrated. Here's the good news. God can change a heart. The one we pray to has the ability to make hard hearts soft so that the next time might be the time that they receive the seed for real and be able to cling to it and that he would get all the glory because he did all the work. Hmm. The main thing we're seeing today in Mark chapter 4 is evangelism and authority and we're going to move much faster through the rest of this um, because we're 20 verses into I think like 41. Don't worry about it. Some of them, like I said, we're just going to kind of read through. We looked at the, the sower, the seed, and the soils. And I want you to kind of think through that. God can change hearts so that as we sow, we should pray. God, make that good soil. Next, we see um, Jesus. If you're taking notes right, light exposure. Light exposure. He said to them, do you bring a lamp in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? Now in that time, clearly that's the way they lit up the room. So that the answer is pretty obvious, right? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. So we see here that we're supposed to let his light shine and, and, and lift up Jesus so that everybody will see Jesus. And an interesting thing about light, and we're going to look at it here, is that Depending on what you're doing, light can feel good or bad. If you're in a broken space and confusion and darkness, and you're looking for light at the end of the tunnel, then light is refreshing. If you're out in the middle of the woods and you're lost and it's nighttime, then seeing someone's flashlight is refreshing. Somebody that's coming to, to, to bring light to a situation where there is darkness and you're looking for light, that's awesome. Right? If somebody's bringing light to something in your life you're trying to hide because of guilt or shame or it's sinful, then light doesn't feel very good. So if somebody goes like, hey, I'm going to shine light on whatever, the trunk of your car. I don't know what's in there, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, hey, hey, I'm, hey, I'm glad I came over today, man. I just came, stopped by. I wanted to shine light on your internet history. Um, Like those things, you're like, ah! Or you could be, right? Depending on what, how you're doing in that area of your life. 
And so light, although it's like life-giving and necessary, sometimes we run from and get mad at, like how dare you bring light in the situation? This is where I keep light out so that I can kind of live in darkness. You need to realize that because this is another evangelism type of, uh, of message here that when light goes, you're supposed to share light and we always feel like, yeah, everybody will be excited about the light. No, they won't. Jesus was the light of the world. People killed him. Not everybody was excited to see that light. For, the, for those that, that longed for it, it was a, a re refreshing breath of fresh air. Salvation, redemption, restoration, purity, wholeness. For those that, that don't want that because of the darkness they live in, that, then it's how could you? How dare you? Get that light away from me. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. There are people that will see you living for Jesus and doing good because the fruit that comes out of you as you've cling to him, um, and they'll see that and they'll glorify your Father in heaven because of the works that God's doing in you, because of the light that you shine. That's awesome. And that's how we are like, yes. Listen to this. John 3, 19 through 21. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Let me tell you something. That's not just like your great acts being done so that everybody can glorify God. That was the first part. But, but even your brokenness, there's, when you live in the truth, you bring your brokenness to the light to bring glory to God. Like, bro, I'm struggling with this and I'm not going to bring it to the darkness or keep it in the darkness. I'm flawed and I'm broken. And I need help. And I know that the only place for this to get fixed is to be dragged into the light, kicking and screaming. So realize this, that as we scatter seed, not everybody will respond. Um, but the ones that do, it's a miraculous thing every single time. That as we shine light, some will be excited and bring glory to the Father because we shine light. And some may hate you because your light exposes the darkness in their hearts. Huh. You guys still with me? Good. We're going to keep going. If you're taking notes right, given for use. Consider carefully what you hear. Hmm. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he, they have, it will be taken from them. Interesting thing is I read this um, this week. I believe it was the Holy Spirit. Um, I just never read it the way I read it. I had fresh eyes to read it. Consider carefully what you hear. So Jesus is talking to them, and when he's, when he's saying consider carefully what you hear, it's the things that he's saying. Consider carefully what you hear with the measure you use. Think about that for a second. Not the measure you hear. With the measure you use it will be measured to you and even more. How many know it's really easy to have like this huge funnel of information with no output? And so we like feel like, man, I'm doing so much better because I listen to so many more things. I have so much more input and there's still no output. I wrote this and it's just a thought of mine. It's not in the scripture. A man who knows little and applies it, is more wise than one who knows much and applies none. So actually, the more I know and I can remain not doing, the more foolish I'm getting. I'm not becoming more wise. Wisdom is the application of the things you know is truth. If you know something is true and you don't do it, the Bible would call us a fool. Hmm. 
Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Maybe you've seen that before. As you actually start to apply the things of God, then more revelation comes to you. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have, will be taken from them. Scripturally, we see that in different, the, the um, parable of the faithful servants, um, and we see other places. It's interesting because it says, they don't have anything, but they're going to take what they do have. So they don't have or they do have. Which one? Right? They don't have anything, but what they do have will be taken from them. We just saw that, the, the, the path a minute ago in the parable of sec, uh, just, that we just talked about. The seed lands there, and, and they don't have it. It's there, but they don't have it. And what they do have gets stolen. It's sitting on top of the path, and it's taken away. Why? Because it doesn't have any depth. It doesn't go anywhere. Don't worry, it wasn't a gunshot. We're good. Given for use, that God gave us things for us to apply them to our life, not just to know them. James 1.22 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Huh. Let's keep moving. I could camp on all of these for a whole message easy, um, but I really want to go through the whole chapter. If you're taking notes right, God does it. This is freeing right here. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stock, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. This is awesome. This is like that with the kingdom, you, you spread the word, you spread it, you spread it, you spread it, you spread it. You can do nothing to save someone. We have a role that we play in salvation, um, and the role is to deliver the word because God decided that that's the way he wants to get his word out there. But God is the only one that can save someone. You don't go like, oh, that guy saved me. No guy saves you except for the God-man, Jesus Christ. Now, by the grace of God, that person exposed you to the gospel, and praise God for using that person in that way. But do not glorify that person. God gets all the glory in that. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says this, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. That's kind of a punch to the throat. Paul's like, I had to talk to you like you were just a baby, and I shouldn't have to right now, but you just don't grow up. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? What is Paul? Only servants through whom you, be, you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. But only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters has one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. That's awesome. Let me just tell you that this verse right here should help us sleep at night. It says whether you sleep or don't, God's kingdom is going to grow. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't use our gifts to the fullest because he gave us to them to be good stewards of them, to wear them out, to pour our lives out for the furthering of the kingdom. But he's the only one that can truly grow the kingdom because you cannot change a person's heart. You can deliver the seed, but only God can do the work of the heart. That he would get all the glory. Every boast would be in him. And Paul says here like, come on man, it's not about the person that delivered that. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about God and what he's done. That is never, listen, I love what God is doing through the Roost Community Church. I'm blessed to be able to be the pastor that gets to preach every week. But it has never been and it will never be about me or the Roost Community Church. We only exist to glorify God. The one that's doing something in this, in this community and just happens to do it through us. Praise God for that. But we're not the only thing he's got going on. Okay. God does it. To him be the glory, and you get some sleep. 
Some of you just heard that and went like, yes, I can be lazy. And you're not doing anything. You're not the one I'm talking to. You need to get to work. The ones that are overworking for the kingdom, you get to take a nap, all right? I'm going to move really quickly through this, but uh, just kingdom expansion and parable ex explanation. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. He's talking about the seeds of planting in the gardens. <coughs> Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all the garden plants. Very large. With such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. So he's talking about the kingdom and the push, push out of the kingdom. That it starts as something very small, but gets to be something very huge. And right now, the gospel has been delivered to almost every corner of the earth. Like every nation, it, it, the gospel has gone there at some point. That doesn't mean that every single person has heard it, but the gospel has been everywhere. And like I said, I don't mean like it's been to every little piece, but it's been in that area. Which is cool that we can say that. There's still a lot of work to be done. A lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done. And none of us get a pass on evangelism. Because all of us are called to the Great Commission. Of spreading the seed everywhere of knowing that God is the one that does the work, praying for God to move in that way, and then going ahead and, and, and sleep at night. Hmm. And this is awesome too, because it's internal and external. Um, do you ever notice that? That one message, one word from God, it, he, he just drops in you, and it changes you completely, and there's growth that happens, and it, and it um, starts small, and it comes to consume your whole life. And on the earth, the same thing happens, that it started um, with a, a group of, of 12 men and some others around them that um, from there is now expanded uh, across the globe. Hmm. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. We're going to close with a quick story. At the end of, of Mark chapter 4, um, Jesus calms the storm. Shows his power not only over sickness in people's bodies, uh, not only over um, the supernatural and, and when casting out demons, but Jesus shows that he's over creation. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boats. Those boats at that time, um, they say could hold probably about 15 men. The, the, the average boat there, the fishing boats there, about 15 men. Um, and it was about, they found one, and it, it was about 26 and a half feet long and seven and a half feet wide. And so Jesus is on a boat with his guys. They're there were also other boats with them, and a furious squall came up, or a great windstorm. The Sea of Galilee is 696 feet be below sea level, um, with, you know, m mountains and hills around. And so uh, there's, there's violent downdraft and violent storms that come on it just instantly. And so you can be out there, and everything seems calm, and then all of a sudden it's just on you, and you're in a bad spot quick. And so that's what happens. Jesus is out there with his, his 12, with other boats with them, and all of a sudden this windstorm comes, a massive, massive windstorm. And the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. It was filling with water. How I many of that will make you a little nervous? I don't swim well. And that's actually giving myself more credit than I should take. So that makes me even more nervous. He's nearly swamped. Jesus was in the, the, the stern. He was in the back of the boat, sleeping on a cushion. There's two things we should take from that. One, the peace that he has, knowing what his mission is and that it will be fulfilled. And two, Jesus' humanity, that he got tired. How I many of you got to be pretty tired to sleep through that? Sleeping on a cushion, the disciples woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up. <laughs> nonchalant, nonchalant this sounds. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Or your Bible might say, Peace, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. 
he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? I don't believe he was saying like, hey, if you had faith, you could have just told the waves to stop. I believe what he's telling them at the time is faith in him and who he is. Like, hey, remember guys, I called you to me. I, I'm not going down in this boat. <laughs> I'm, I'm the Messiah, right? Like, and, and you've seen me cast out demons. You've seen me heal people instantly. I didn't come to die on my way across the, the lake. Story's not as good that way. So Jesus says like, do you still have no faith? Listen to this. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. I love the book of Mark and I love the way we've been going through it because constantly over and over and over we see these amazing, powerful messages. We also see uh, Jesus cast out demons and show his authority over the supernatural. We see him um, get rid of sickness and show his authority over, over the brokenness and the flaws, the sickness and death of the world. And then here we see his authority over everything, all creation, the wind and the waves. He says, quiet, be still. And they... Colossians 1, 15 through 17 says this, the sun is the image of the invisible God. When they said, who is this? It's because they were scared. They've never seen anything like that. Wait a minute. You can just tell the, the waves to stop. And they just stop. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He just proved it. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It's crazy how um, creation, when Jesus speaks, responds instantly, knowing that he's in control. And he speaks to us all the time, and we're like, eh. And we see Jesus' authority over everything, over everything. And this whole chapter we've seen that God gets all the credit because God does all the work. And that we do have a job, we do have a role that we play, and we'll be held accountable for the way that we do that role. Um, we do it out of a, a, an overflow. It's the fruit of us clinging. It's the fruit of the seed going down deep inside of us so that it consumes us and comes out. It's the fruit of that. Our responsibility is to plant seeds in others so that same thing would happen. The mercy and the grace and the love that he exposed us to in and, and, and Jesus Christ, we would expose others to. That how will they know if they don't hear? And how, how will they hear if they're not told? That we have a responsibility to be farmers and sowers. And we need to know that the one that we pray to, the one that we roll with, the one that, whose mission that we're on, is the one that reigns over everything. The peace that comes so we can sleep at night as we're on this journey with him is knowing that the one that I have a relationship with, my father in heaven, I'm a son or daughter of the most high God and he can do anything at any moment. He has power over everything, over the, the supernatural, over the natural. He controls all of it. Jesus did not come just as a good teacher. He did not come just as a prophet. He's the God man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. I want to pray for us. Next week, I'm really excited um, in Mark chapter 5. You ever heard of Legion? The demons that are and the man in the scripture that gets cast out. That's next week. So uh, um, a young girl being brought back from, from death. Um, we're going to see the authority of Jesus. That God came to the earth and proved 
that it's God here on the earth because no one has ever or will ever do the types of things and the ways that Jesus Christ did, confirming the message that he spoke. He came to speak that message and preach that message of repent for the kingdom is near and, in, and, and to validate that message and show who he really was. He did those miracles and, and none greater than dying on the cross and three days later being raised from the dead that in his resurrection we have hope of a resurrection. And his ascension that now he sits on the throne. We don't worship a dead man, but a living God who sits on the throne now. Let's do this. You got those two things when you came in? Um, you came ready to give today? Prepare that. Get it ready. We'll receive that um, at the end here. Uh, connection card on the back there says, my next step today. I don't know what it is for you. I don't know. Maybe today you come and, and, and you say, hey, I'm... I recognize that I'm one of those soils and it's not one of the good ones. I believe that God exposed that to you on purpose because he wants to do a work in you and he uses his word to draw you to himself. And so if he's revealed that to you, it's time to respond and say, God, change my heart. Do a work in me. God, do produce in me what you want To put our faith in Jesus Christ, in his strength, not our own. In his righteousness, not our own. In his works, not our own. I'm making a first-time decision to give my life to Jesus. Maybe that's you. The only way to be right with God, the only way to be in relationship with God is through the works of Jesus Christ and us putting our faith in the grace that he gave. And you feel far from God and you've never had a relationship with God. And today... Um, you're ready to, to do that. That's, that's God drawing you to himself, and to that you should smile big and be excited. I'm recommitting my life to Jesus. I don't know what that, uh, your, your past looks like before you came here today. Um, maybe you can say, you know what? I, I was the one that sprung up quick, or I spring up quick a lot, but I'm not really having any length to this and strength to this. There are no root system, and, and it's, it's time for me to recommit again because I keep burning out. Maybe that's you and you're ready to recommit in that way. Maybe you say, you know, I've, there's no producing in my life. Every time I started to grow at all, the worries of this world, the, the, the distractions of, of wanting wealth um, or, or the things of this world, the desires of this world, choke it out every single time. But today I'm, I'm, I'm here and God spoke to my heart because he's prepared my heart now to receive him in a way that I would be able to cling and, and move forward. That'd be awesome. I'm ready to be baptized. Um, we've been so blessed. Baptism is an outward expression of what's gone on on the inside. That it's the new me, the new creation. The old me is dead and gone. The new me has come. We've had the opportunity in less than three years to baptize. I don't even know the number now. It's a hundred and something people that have said yes. Yes. I'm one of the followers of Jesus Christ. He is my God. My faith is in Christ. And done that in a public declaration. We've got the opportunity to do that. I'm interested in becoming a member of The Roots. Um, we have several people that went to membership class last week. We'll do it again uh, next month. We'll do membership. Um, we're called to be a part of a local body, a local family of believers. And I hope that this is the family that you want to be a part of. We'd love to have you as part of the family. If not, let's get you connected to a local family that loves Jesus and preaches the word, loves you. I'd like to join a community group. We need authentic relationships to walk through this with. I'm interested in serving at the Roots. Um, Greg talked about it in the video earlier. If you just check that box, we'll talk to you about, hey, where's the best fit for you? If you're a smiley person that likes to say hi to people, we don't want to stick you in like a ministry that's hiding in the back somewhere. If you're a person that's kind of introverted, we don't want to put you at the front door. For your sake, you will go crazy. And the bottom says, I will. I don't know what God's put on your heart. I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know. Um, but I pray that you would respond to what he has put on your heart. That we would use what he's revealed. Not just talk about it, think about it, but apply it to our lives by his strength. And then prayer requests and praise reports. We're going to have some prayer partners here on the side in just a moment. If you need prayer for anything, we believe in the power of prayer. Why? Because the God we serve has the power to do anything. He can say, quiet, be still, and the wind and the waves stop. That's the God we pray to. 
And so we want to partner with you in prayer for anything that might be going on in your life. Maybe your relationship is in a broken place. Maybe your heart is in a broken place and you need healing. We want to believe God for those types of things. Maybe you need provision. Um, we want to believe God for those types of things. We want to believe with you in that because I, I just know that we can encourage each other's faith in doing that. Maybe you have a praise report we'd like to celebrate with you um, also. So what we're going to do is um, the buckets aren't going to be passed today. They're going to be at the doors. And, and come out, come out, ushers, when they hold the buckets, step into the light a little bit more because sometimes we're kind of in a dark cave in the corner um, just so people can see you on the way through. So uh, I'm going to pray. We're going to stand and worship. And then on your way out today, just go ahead and drop those um, in the bucket. God, I thank you for the opportunity to be here, to preach your word, to get into um, your presence with your people and be impacted and inspired by your word, Lord God. God, I pray that we would own uh, the fact that you have called us to the commission. God, that we would just be humble farmers that throw seed everywhere, not knowing what the condition of the heart is. God, that we would not judge that from the external, but we would put it everywhere knowing that, that God, you know the condition of the heart. And God, I, I pray that, that if maybe we're here today and we've had hard hearts, that you would soften them. God, do a tilling work, a plowing work in the heart. God, maybe today if we've, we've been had shallow hearts and no roots, God, help those roots to go deep. God, maybe we've been choked out by the worries of this world, the deceptions of this world. God, that we've served, served this world instead of, instead of you, Lord God. I pray that today that those, those thorns would just be ripped out from the roots. Not just cut down where they were returned, but they would be ripped out of our lives. And God, I just Thank you for, for the production, uh, for the, the, the producing um, of fruit in our lives already. God, we know that it only comes from us remaining in you. It's not out of our own effort, but, but out of you, Lord God, doing a work inside of us, that you would get all the credit. God, help us to shine the light, knowing that for the ones that, that you've called to it, that are drawn to it, that are excited about it, it brings glory to your name and salvation for their souls, Lord God. And let us do that even though some people will hate the fact that we raise the light up. Let us be strong in our evangelism, knowing that the authority is in you. That you love us and that you love others. Help us to show that love to everyone. God, I thank you that in your presence there is freedom. I thank you that you don't, do not give us a spirit of fear or timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline or self-control. God, I thank you that you're in this place and that you're in our lives for everyone who's put their faith in you. God, continue to draw us to yourself. God, give us the, the strength, the courage to move forward in that relationship with you. God, I thank you for all of this. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let's stand. Let's worship together.